like we did every night before bed. Penny and I were lying in bed reading. As I was reading a trashy love novel with my two-year-old wife, I was a hunting catalog reader. The book had an Adonis on the cover, bare-chested, his blonde hair blowing in the wind as he held a barely-dressed wench with enormous, heaving breasts, with a query that will always be in my ears. Penny broke the quiet. What would you do if you found out I was having an affair? I said nothing at all. I simply reached to my nightstand, took out my 38 special, removed the safety, and shot my wife in the eyes. She had given me a gorgeous 16x24 inch photo for my birthday last year, and the bullet literally tore through it. It made a neat hole in the wall behind her. It will also require vinyl siding repair. My ears were ringing from the small gun's loudness without any protection. Damn. To put it nicely, Penny soiled the linens. She was still shivering, but when she was able to speak, she cried out, Are you crazy? What the hell did you do that for? In order to respond to your inquiries, let me say that, no, I'm not insane, and then let me tell you what will happen if you ever betray me. I'll only take a snapshot of your lovely face, not your photo. I'll have you see my execution of the adulterous man who violated our marriage vows first though. My solemn word is with you on this. Do you have any other queries? Not even a whisper. That night, none of us pressed against the other. You're never going to know. I rehung the picture the following morning, glass shattered and all, and the topic was never brought up again. I foolishly believed that the reminder would ensure faithfulness. Let's fast forward five years. It didn't matter how I discovered my wife was having an affair. Let me just sum up by saying that I was positive that at 11 in the morning, she would be in our bed cheating on her boss, a 57-year-old man named Roger Lamb. My pulse was racing with excitement when I got home at 11.10 since the driveway was empty. I hoped my information was incorrect, but I had to enter to make sure nobody was home. I was able to pull into the driveway from the master bedroom without being noticed because our home has a side access garage. I nearly passed out as soon as I opened the garage door. Next to Penny's BMW was a black Mercedes belonging to someone else. I understood my obligations. Breathing deeply, I gently loaded six high-velocity bullets into the 12-gauge pump shotgun. These were duck cartridges that blasted more than 100 feet into the air and spewed out steel. I turned around and cautiously opened the door. There was a heap of abandoned clothing on the Italian marble corridor floor, which Penny had to have. My wife's unworn bra and my lace panties, which were my birthday present to her, were hanging from the banister, and it made me furious. I could hear them having sex like beasts in our married bed as I upped the spiral staircase. Just the guttural noises of two lovers unable to communicate, with no words. With the door ajar, I witnessed Lamir violently hitting my spouse, his plump, white behind quivering with every blow. In order to keep Penny from seeing me, I waited until he straightened up before approaching from behind. I really wanted this to come as a surprise. I pointed the shotgun about six inches from the base of his skull and pulled the trigger as he started to get into a rhythm. The barrel exploded in flames, and a hundred steel pellets the size of Pete entered his skull. To my amazement, his body managed to withstand two more shocks before crashing onto Penny. When his gray matter and bright crimson blood splashed all over her, Penny gave one last cry before going silent. She passed out. I had no prior experience killing someone, and I was at a loss for what to do. I rolled the dead bastard off Penny and onto the floor because I really wanted to talk to her before I killed her. He had a clean one-inch diameter wound in his forehead from the gunshots. Up until now, every deceased person I had ever seen had been artificially made to appear asleep by an undertaker. No, Lemire appeared extremely lifeless, and he wouldn't be interred in an exposed coffin. With a bang, he hit the floor, and as he did, I noticed that his eyes remained open, staring at me. Since this unnerved me, I must say, I grabbed the blanket off the bed and draped it over the body. I waited for a few minutes before losing patience. I went to the restroom, filled a glass with cold water, and gave Penny a face splashing. She shook her head and sat up. She appeared to be attempting to determine whether this was all just a bad dream. When she ran her hand over her face and received a handful of Lamir's brains in return, she knew it wasn't. The sheer dread in her eyes told me that she was aware of the true nature of her situation. She attempted to scream, but her terror stopped her from doing so. Her mouth making a gulping sound, similar to an asthmatic struggling to breathe, was the only sound she made. Before long, her screams resembled those of a banshee took over. I started to get nervous that I wouldn't have the courage to shoot her. 
Shooting a big bastard in the back is one thing, but killing the woman I loved is quite another. I mean, you know, I'm an accountant, not an assassin. I get mad will you cry. I'm telling you right now, cut the crap. It won't help you one bit. I gave her a towel so she could clean the blood and brains off her bare breasts. She opened her mouth to say something, but her shaking lips made it impossible for me to comprehend her. I wanted to hear what she had to say, so I advised her to settle down and take a long breath. It took me a few minutes to eventually make it out. Am I going to die? Remember what I told you I would do if you had an affair. She gave a head nod. Can you give me one good reason why I shouldn't kill you? Her face was the most confused I've ever seen, as though she was searching all the way down to the most amazing phrase that would spare her death penalty. Finally, she muttered, no. You've been my wife for seven years, so I'll give you seven minutes to reconcile with God. I warn you, if you try to talk me out of killing you, I'll blow your head off in an instant. After glancing at my watch, I declared, time's up. Penny closed her eyes, and I could see her lips moving, so I figured she was praying. Then, with a pitying moan, she opened her eyes. Five minutes. I'm so sorry I screwed up. I, I, I. For four minutes, Penny went silent. If I only had four minutes to live, I wonder what I would do. I checked the time on my watch. Penny closed her eyes and whispered, time's up. Her lips moved, so I figured she was praying. Then, with a pitying moan, she opened her eyes. Penny paused her speech and said, five minutes. I'm so sorry I screwed up. I, 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 four minutes. If I'd only had four minutes to live, I wonder what I would do. I checked the time on my watch. Three minutes, Matt. I'm so scared. Tears were streaming down my face as I said, me too. Two minutes. Does this going to hurt a lot? Penny's tears were more intense, and she eventually broke down in speech. Close your eyes. You'll open them in heaven. I nodded and aimed the gun at her heart, saying, please shoot me in the chest, not the face. The distinctive metallic sound of the bolt chambering a 12-gauge cartridge reverberated throughout the room as it said, Dubai, I love you. I squeezed the trigger, taking my wife's life with a I love you too. The gunshot pierced her chest to the same extent as the wound she left in my heart. I sobbed for at least an hour while I sat down next to her lifeless corpse. I took out a notebook and started writing my confession after that. My stomach growled, and I remembered that all I had eaten all day was a cup of coffee. I began by telling her about the hole in the picture and concluded with, I am a man of my word, and I kept my promise to my wife. I figured that if I contact the cops today, I might be lucky to get a bite to eat before tomorrow morning. Then an idea came to her, pizza. I went downstairs and looked at the menu of the Italian delivery restaurant next door. I assumed that this would be my final pizza. While I waited, I opened what would be my last bottle of beer and wrote my brother a note. I gave him instructions on how to get rid of my belongings bank account details, etc. I filled a priority mail package with Penny's insurance policy, all of my cash, and several keys, sealed it, and attached the appropriate postage. After half an hour, the doorbell rang. Making the delivery guy's day, I gave him $25 and told him to keep the change. Uncertain about its veracity, I recalled that practically all detective shows removed the villain's shoelaces and belt to prevent him from hanging himself. I didn't want to act like a homeless person in court, since I knew there would be TV cameras there. To ensure my narrative would be told, I changed out of what I thought would be my last hot shower and into comfy slacks that didn't require a belt and loafers. I forwarded copies of my confession to two reporters whose names I knew from the local paper's front page. I wanted everyone to understand the necessity of what I was doing. I put the envelopes in the mailbox at the drugstore after walking for about a half mile. I became aware that this was my final stroll as a free man as I made my way back. A full 10 minutes later, I strolled around our home one more time, concluding in the master bedroom. I gave Penny a final kiss before heading downstairs to make the police call. I signed my confession and set it down on the ground next to the dismantled shotgun. 911, what is your emergency? My name is Matthew Weiss. I just shot my wife and her lover. I have your address, 2201 Morrison Street. Yes, ma'am. They're in the bedroom, upstairs. I'm sending a squad car and an ambulance. I've alerted the officers that you're armed. Please take your intent. No problem, ma'am. Tell the officer I will offer no resistance. The front door is wide open, and I'll be lying face down with my fingers behind my head. After a few minutes, 
the first patrol vehicle showed up. It took them nearly as long to enter and place my handcuffs. It was an unmarked automobile that took me to the station. The days that followed seemed to fly by. I was asked endless questions, so I was relieved to eat before turning myself in. It's worth mentioning that this was the first double homicide in the peaceful neighborhood where I live. Everybody appeared eager to speak with me. Even when I repeatedly told them that my confession covered everything, they persisted in asking me questions. I was being questioned by a detective who kept asking if I had ever considered suicide. I would always respond the same way. A guy is not a man if he breaks his word. I simply did what I solemnly promised to do. While I wouldn't tell him how I knew my wife was having an affair, more so, while she was going on a date with her lover, he became even more irate. I am a man of my word, and I was vowed to silence, so his flowery language didn't make me loose my tongue. There was only a metal table with two chairs and me shackled to it. There was no window or clock, so I had no idea how much time had passed. Later, a state police investigator took over the interrogation, as it was early evening, as I thought. He appeared to be a decent enough man. He even extended a cup of coffee to me. It had an awful flavor. I retold my story. When it was time for me to appear in court, he promised to return and thank me for his time. A psychiatrist then checked me out to see if I had gone insane. He was not happy with my responses, so I explained when he asked if I felt regret, I feel betrayed. I was betrayed by a woman who promised before God and men to leave everyone else behind, and I had to do what I did, otherwise I would not be a man. Before he said he had everything he needed, we must have debated for two hours straight about my ethics and values. After being cuffed, I was sent to my cell to await the arrival of the next inquisitor. I was taken before a judge for my arraignment the following morning. Upon reading the indictment, I was asked if I wanted to enter a guilty plea. My court-appointed lawyer, who appeared to be right out of law school, said, Guilty, your honor. No, your honor, my client didn't do it. I mean, it was a crime of passion, and I'm claiming temporary insanity on his part, I said with equal force. I was not CRA, and I knew what I was doing, I yelled. Your honor, may I please speak? The audience erupted in applause. Let the murderer speak. Cries could be heard. Some offered suggestions on how to kill me. A man wearing a gaudy suit shoved his way in front. I answered, yes, my confession is real, to which a couple of beefy sheriff's deputies pulled me out of the courtroom. Thompson of the Times, I received your confession in the mail, Mr. Weiss. Is it accurate? The judge never got back to me. I had another wonderful evening at the Gray Bar Hotel, which included room service. I had dinner, which consisted of a green bean salad, potato chips, and sausage sandwich. I then sat on my bunk and looked at the wall till the lights went off. The worst thing happened that evening. When Matthew Weiss awoke, he was immobile. He believed that he was trapped in a conscious dream from which he was unable to awaken. He started to get anxious. The rest of his body was cool, but he could feel his pillow was drenched in sweat. He attempted to cry out, but was unsuccessful. He was limited to only blinking. Weiss was told to get out of bed by the jailer when he arrived in the morning to count the inmates. When he didn't, he opened the cell and phoned for further help. They quickly came to the conclusion that he wasn't acting. After having a stroke, Matthew Weiss became paralyzed. When paramedics arrived, they took him to an ambulance. Handcuffed on a gurney, his right wrist was brought to county hospital. He was lying in bed with a maze of tubes and wires attached to him the next thing he knew. He heard someone say that while he had a big stroke, there was hope for his recovery. After six months, he had sufficient range of motion in his left arm to feed himself. He remained silent after that. Since the county doesn't give money to acknowledge murderers for physical therapy, Matthew Weiss was forced to spend the remainder of his life staring at the wall while seated in a wheelchair. The minimum wage intern would occasionally turn on the television. It made no difference, he was living in his head, replaying his marriage, skipping the difficult moments and focusing on the pleasant ones. He also engaged in a stimulating philosophical discussion over his verdict. He had no doubts that he would see his wife again. Matthew Weiss's soul was taken ten years later by the angel of death. He smiled as he passed away. Mrs. Lumiere also smiled when the reporter called to inform her that her husband's killer had passed away. Her secret died with him, which is why she smiled. The fact that she was the one who called Matthew to force him to demonstrate his reliability will never be known.